You're listening to Three Kitchens, a member of the Alberta Podcast Network. Locally grown, community supported. Join your host, Aaron Walker, Sarah Soma Syndrome, and Heather Dyer. What's on today's menu? This episode of Three Kitchens is brought to you by Alberta Blue Cross. Life as a business owner can be hectic, to say the least. Alberta Blue Cross understands that. They offer flexible health, dental life, and disability coverage for your employees. Even better, you can let your staff enroll and manage their coverage at any time and on any device. That makes life easier for them and for you. You've got this when it comes to group coverage for your small business, and Alberta Blue Cross has got your back. To learn more and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. Welcome to Three Kitchens. As you heard off the top, we are Aaron and Sarah and Heather, and we are here to tempt you with delicious food. Hi, ladies. Hello. Hello. You sound you sound so quirky. Well, I don't know. It's <laughs> Friday afternoon. I'm already thinking about the cocktail I'm going to pour in like right. an hour or so when it's happy hour. Yeah. I just an hour. You got to wait a whole hour. Oh, oh maybe not that long. It's just been a long week. I think we're Agreed. all kind of kooky by Friday afternoon. Yeah, we don't usually record on. Friday afternoon. Dude, no. I'm sort of lost it at this point. That's kind of how I am. I'm a little, yeah. I feel like sorts. the springs so are something. loose. <laughs> the marbles are flying away out of my sight. <laughs> <laughs> So today we have an, a very interesting, informative, and fun mm-hmm. episode. I mean, what more could people want? Information. Delicious, too. Oh, don't forget informative, that. Informative, yeah. fun, and delicious. Mm-hmm. We have guests from the Calgary Fire Department. We have their um, information officer who's helping us out by telling us all about kitchen fire safety. And then we have a few firefighters talking about what they cook and what they eat and how that all goes down behind the doors at the fire station it's not something most of us get a chance to see they're going to tell us about it yeah and there are a lot of um misconceptions and a lot of laughs with this one Mm. so you guys are going to enjoy this listeners so let's get right to it yeah let's jump right in so we have a special guest here with us today her name is carol hankey and she is the public information officer with the calgary fire department hi carol hello Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Would you mind for our listeners introducing yourself, uh, kind of telling us a bit about your background and what you do? Sure. So I um, grew up in Thompson, Manitoba and moved to Calgary in the fall of 96 uh, for love. And uh, good news, we're still together. So uh, (laughs) nice. (laughs) Good choices. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I lucked out. He's an amazing person. So I have a degree, uh, a Bachelor of Nursing. I have a Bachelor of Psychology as well from the University of Manitoba. So my first career was really nursing. And then I was looking for a different type of challenge uh, that uh, was a little more physical in nature. And a friend of mine was on the fire department. So I applied. I wasn't successful the first time. but Uh, The second time I applied, I was successful and my class started 13 days after 9-11 happened. So it was really in the forefront of all our minds what the risks were for the career we were getting into. And, you know, with any career, there's ups and downs, but I can honestly say that there hasn't been one day where I've regretted joining the fire department and I just love it. And I, I never had anticipated that my career trajectory would take me to be the spokesperson for the fire department and now I'm uh, you know nine and a half years in in this particular position and uh, I absolutely love it. I just love sharing that positive proactive information and representing the fire department and talking about all the good stuff that our folks do on a day-to-day basis to serve the citizens of Calgary. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so we invited you to join us to talk a little bit about kitchen safety, home kitchen safety. And now I can't remember which lovely co-host we're going to ask some questions about that. <laughs> that I think that was <laughs> That's you. That was me. Um what percentage of home fires start in the kitchen? Like how common is this? Oh, it is exceedingly common. The most common cause of indoor fires mm. is 
cooking left unattended. And they're not all full-blown fires, but a pot on the stove that's left unattended creates a lot of smoke. If people are cooking with oil, that really is the most dangerous type of kitchen fire because once oil reaches its ignition temperature, it bursts into flame. So if you've left the kitchen to do something else and you got distracted, you'll come into the kitchen. I mean, if you've been alerted maybe by a smoke alarm or you're, you remember suddenly, oh, I think I've got something on the stove. You walk in and there are flames. And sometimes those flames have already spread to the cabinets above or the surrounding area. And those are really dangerous because what happens sometimes if people don't know what to do, you know, they might be tempted to put water on it and that creates right. a huge explosion. So if you've ever uh, watched a YouTube video of someone putting water on an oil fire or grease fire, yeah, that that creates an even more dangerous situation. Sometimes people are tempted to grab the pot and try and put it in the sink or walk it outside. And that creates the danger of uh, spilling that burning oil all over the floor, onto yourself, the burns are significant. You think about boiling water, which is at 100 degrees, burning oil is several hundred degrees, so the burns are that much worse and go deeper as well. So those are really significant uh, injuries and incredible risk of spreading the fire to your entire kitchen very quickly. So that is the most common indoor source of fires. The most common source of outdoor fires is the improper disposal of smoking materials. I just wanted to add that on there because we're still seeing people mm -hmm. putting cigarette butts in planter pots and fires can start even in the winter time mm -hmm. in planter pots. So I know we're talking about kitchen, you know, cooking specifically, <laughs> but I just wanted to add that in just as a little aside because it, uh, it bears reminding you need to have a sturdy non-combustible container with sand or water in it and a lid because it's very windy sometimes in Calgary mm -hmm. and you need to empty it regularly. I've seen a fire start in a coffee tin that was full of cigarette butts and then those ignited when someone <laughs> put the next cigarette butt inside and it actually oh, burned the side of the house. Oh my, yeah. It's fairly predictable where fires start and we collect great stats so that we can share that preventative information. Mm. Maybe you can tell us more about what happens if you do have an oil fire in your kitchen. Mm. What would you do? So the first preventative tip is always stay in the kitchen when you're cooking, especially on the stovetop. Yes, when you have something in the oven, you can leave, but set a timer for yourself so you don't forget. If you happen to have a, a grease fire, the first thing you want to do is not panic. Always have a lid handy. That's another piece that's really important. An oven mitt, so what we tell people is if you have a fire, first of all, you need to make that quick decision. Is this something I can handle? Or if it's not, if it's already grown, you need to get everyone out of the house and call 911 from outside, leave it to the professionals. But if it's still contained to the pot and you're comfortable doing this, put an oven mitt on, grab the lid, slowly, carefully put the lid on top of the pot, then turn the element off and leave it. What you're doing is you're eliminating oxygen from the fire. Then the heat will slowly drop. If you put the lid on and then take it off again, there's still enough heat. You're <laughs> reintroducing oxygen and it will reignite again. Because fire needs three things to exist, right? It needs heat, needs a fuel source, and oxygen. So by putting the lid on and turning the element off, first of all, you're eliminating the oxygen and then you're slowly uh, eliminating the heat component. Leave it, do not move it because that is superheated oil and you're at risk for burning oh. yourself or spreading the fire. And some people might ask, well, I have this fire extinguisher in my kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. squirreled away under the kitchen sink. It's been there for 15 years. Um, it <laughs> probably won't work. <laughs> <laughs> the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, does not actually recommend using a fire extinguisher at home for a grease fire oh, because okay. the tendency for people is to get right in there really close and then the force can actually spread the burning mm. oil around right. your kitchen so really the safest have a lid oven mitt put the oven mitt on take the lid put it on turn the element off and just leave it and then call skip the dishes or uh, Uber Eats. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes. dinner is done you're not right? eating that one now <laughs> yeah. yeah so that is it but i always want to say if you're not comfortable doing that 
get everyone out of the house and call 911 because it the call itself will take a couple minutes. Fire doubles in size approximately every 30 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds. So you want to make sure everyone is out and call 911 from outside. Great tips. I'm happy to say that I haven't had to deal with that ever. Have you guys ever had no. a grease fire? No. 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 To circle back to the question of how common are these fires, we attend uh, kitchen fires every oh. single day. On average, between one to two kitchen fires every single day. Now, some are just a pot on the stove where smoke has activated the smoke alarm mm -hmm. and we need to ventilate. The fire ha you know, hasn't actually done any, any significant damage. However, it is really, really common. Yeah, mm -hmm. no kidding. So we talked about indoor cooking safety tips. So mm -hmm. summer's coming. I know it doesn't look like it outside right now. <laughs> um, but, but barbecues, smokers, you know, even fire pits, I imagine. Any any tips around that or any statistics? Yeah, um, barbecue fires, uh, fire pit fires aren't as common. I would say fires related to barbecues are more common than fires that have extended from a fire pit. And so the issue with barbecues is them being left on accidentally barbecues placed too close to something combustible like a deck railing or the side of your house a lot of homes their siding is uh, vinyl and that is uh, plastic and will melt very easily so those are the types of fires that we would attend related to barbecues barbecue covers melting if they're put on too quickly after right. a barbecue has been turned off there's still enough heat there or propane tanks not uh, being tightened enough or maybe there's some venting or some leaking from the propane tank as well and even damage to the to the lines because we get very very windy days here sometimes and if your barbecue is situated in a place where you know a gust of wind can come and push it over that that's happened before it's tied into your your gas line it can it can cause some damage there as well right. fire pits we have a fire pit bylaw you can visit the website calgary.ca and all the information is there. Sounds great. Let's put a link to that. Good point. We'll make sure yeah. to link to um, that in our show notes. And the other thing that we wanted to kind of get into a little bit is cooking and eating at the fire station. Yeah. And this whole, the whole idea kind of for this episode came about because I get asked whether my husband can cook because they assume anybody who works at a fire <laughs> station cooks and there's like this sort of idea, I don't know if it's like an urban myth or what it is, that a whole lot of really good cooking happens at the fire hall. I think I've asked you that question, Heather. I think most people asked I that, know yeah. have asked, or they ask him and then he's really embarrassed because he doesn't cook. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, we have a few questions about food culture and cooking at the fire hall. Yeah, we were kind of wondering about sort of the history and the evolution of cooking in the fire hall. And I mean, a lot of people who go to work don't often have that opportunity to cook and eat as a group. And so we were wondering sort of what the history of cooking in and having kitchens in fire halls was, because I think it's really unique. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the few jobs, unless you're a chef, where... <laughs> <laughs> working yeah. in a kitchen yeah where you get to uh, cook together the fire hall uh, traditionally was called the firehouse and because you are spending so much time together it really is a team and crew environment and because you never know when the next emergency is going to come in every fire station is equipped with a full kitchen mm -hmm. several fridges depending on how many crew members are located in that station uh, some people assume that the food that firefighters purchase for their meals is paid for by by the job, by the taxpayers. It's not. Every firefighter puts in their own money and they have an allocated amount for the tour. So the tour is the days that they're working and they put in a set amount. When I first started, it was $5. And then the more people you have, the more that money is sort of leveraged for larger amounts, right? And then you decide what you can afford. You do some meal planning typically. Now that we're 24 hour shifts, they are buying for lunch and supper 
as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cost has obviously gone up and it's probably going to go up even more with inflation <laughs> that we've, ex has everyone noticed mm -hmm. that? Oh, oh yeah, them? boy. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Firefighters on average are fairly uh, thrifty, I want to say. So, you know, you're checking what's on sale and then meal planning according to that and as well as likes and dislikes. And definitely there has been a trend towards healthier food. I think when I first started, it used to be more the sort of grayish, uh, <laughs> gray, gray, beige, brown. <laughs> you know, uh, there is uh, famously one meal called the number ones, and it was like a Salisbury steak, and you had gravy and this big like uh, patty with fried onions and mashed potatoes. But right. definitely, firefighters <laughs> have uh, the trend has been to healthier food right we're more concerned about our health you see less firefighters smoking definitely we we want to be healthier about uh, taking care of ourselves right and right. yes they mm -hmm. take the fire truck to go shopping mm -hmm. however and the whole crew because a call can come in any time and there's been many a time where you know a fire crew has been in a Safeway or a superstore and all of a sudden over the radio a call comes in so they basically have to drop the groceries run to the truck and respond to the call and then some nice staff at at that store will have put it aside so that when they come back from the call <laughs> that uh that they they purchase it so because they are constantly on duty firefighters yeah. don't get breaks in the sense that oh i'm off the clock now for 15 minutes or half an hour because it's right, lunch right. you are always right. on the clock yeah. we have very strict standards for shoot time response times and we always try to meet those yeah absolutely so have firefighters always cooked then for themselves or did that kind of evolve over time with the job as far as i know it has always been something that firefighters have done i would have to check with the museum to see mm. like how far back we have some mm. some really old uh, cookbooks it's a it's a good question and when the museum opens sometime this year i would love oh. to in, invite you ladies to to come check it out yeah that sounds fun yeah no I kidding i was just gonna ask what museum i didn't know there was a museum but it hasn't opened yes yet. well it was open then it wasn't we've just had some changes going on our new museum staff member she is doing an amazing job along with the uh museum board and hopefully this this year sometime we will be able to open and uh, share what we have with calgary oh Ooh, fantastic. That would be great yeah. i want to see those cookbooks <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah has there been a cookbook published recently not recently no no there hasn't we haven't been able to do that but what I can do is find some of the uh, old versions and, and share that with you guys. Oh, if, that's if you're really interested. cool. No kidding. Mm -hmm. That would be great. So we talked a lot about safety and fire safety at home. I'm assuming the fire hall also has some fire safety issues when they get called out in the middle of cooking. Has that changed over time? I, I'm assuming that maybe some fires have happened in fire halls <laughs> with uh, unattended food and stuff since we all make that mistake at the best of times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Has mm -hmm. that changed over time? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the evolution of learning from your mistakes, right? So many, many years ago, way before I came on, uh, there was an incident at uh, one of the fire stations where they were in the midst of cooking a meal, I think French fries, <laughs> and a uh, a call came in, and because they all just you know took off, ran to the truck to go to the emergency, the pot was left on, and uh, a fire ensued. Oh, so wow. due to that, there is now a system in every fire station, and most fire stations have gas stoves so mm -hmm. when the tones go the tones are what alert us to the fact that we have an emergency we need to respond to when the tones go the gas is automatically shut off to the mm -hmm. stove so you don't have to oh did we shut the stove off no we're mm -hmm. on the, we're on our way to a house fire we can't <laughs> go back so I mean, you you learn through through these situations and then we make improvements to enhance the safety within the fire station. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really smart. What a great idea. Yeah. And then you got to come back and see how you can salvage your yeah. cooking, right? Yeah. It stopped <laughs> partway through. 
what's it going to be when we come back? Yeah, yeah. The, those would have been very grease-laden French fries yeah. if they hadn't have burned up. Uh, yeah. but, <laughs> and there's also now a button that you have to actually push when you come back from the call to reset oh, okay. the gas so mm -hmm. that it Great. will start up again. That's so smart. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to wrap this up. But if you're game, Carol, we kind of quick fire questions where you just answer oh. super quick. Okay, and it's supposed to be fun. So don't think too okay. hard about it. Okay, fun. okay, put on my fun face. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you remember the worst thing that you've eaten at the fire station? Besides the grage, number one. <laughs> grage. Yeah, I, I was not a fan of shepherd's pie. Mm. I don't know why. Oh. It, maybe it was just that particular recipe. But I was just sure I'll eat it. Ah, not your ah. favorite <laughs> no. okay so at a fire hall you would have you could have upwards of what's an average number that you're feeding say at one meal well the minimum would be four but some stations have multiple apparatus so i mean at one point we would have you know close to 20 people at 16 station mm. but that has has diminished so it really depends mm. on how many apparatus are at a fire station so do you have a suggestion for us for an a meal for a crowd um if you're trying to be more uh, frugal with the costs you know it depends on what's on sale uh caesar salad with uh with chicken tuna sandwiches like a um, tuna melt you know mm -hmm. are are always good Ooh, um now i want that for lunch <laughs> yeah i know all of a sudden i want to tuna melt exactly erin <laughs> right she said tuna melt and i was like oh watering mouth <laughs> okay now personally if it was your last meal what would you request oh that is that is a, hmm. presumably you'd have time to think about it depending on why it's your last meal <laughs> yep <laughs> Mm, I really like sushi. Mm, sushi. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. <laughs> I I really I really like yeah. sushi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, and complete the sentence. Peanut butter and tuna? Hi. <laughs> okay, here's a no, there's a story. There's a what? story there. There there is a story there. I did not uh, expect that. Nope. I know, right? I, I'm full of surprises. So yes. many, many, many years ago pre-kids, probably 20 years ago, I thought I would make a different type of tuna casserole. I thought, oh, I wonder what it would taste like with a hummus-based sauce. And um, that was before I, I knew exactly what went into hummus. So please forgive <laughs> my ignorance. Uh, I thought it was a, more of a peanut-based mm. sauce, uh, not sesame. I didn't have tahini. I didn't have uh, sesame anything. I thought peanut. So I put in some peanut butter with, you know, chickpeas and uh, cooked it. And then my husband went to take a forkful and he said, uh, Carol, please tell me you did not put peanut butter in the tuna casserole. And so I went into this long spiel validating and, and explaining what my thought process and my logic was to do that. And so he politely ate it, but said, uh, yeah, you probably don't need to make that recipe anymore. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so that's my story. It's embarrassing, but it's a true story. And uh, it's one of my funnier stories about my own like mishaps in the kitchen. So there you have it. Full disclosure, uh, when I think peanut butter, it reminds me of the funny story of when I combined peanut butter and tuna <laughs> in the casserole. <laughs> That might just be the best answer for that question yeah. that I, we I will ever have. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I, tuna. And yeah. it's embarrassing. Yes, I get it. But you know what? I'm willing to put myself out there. So there you have it. <laughs> I like that. That's a good attitude to have. There's a lot of embarrassing things that happen on this podcast <laughs> with food. So don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. This was informative and fun which yeah. is yes. you know the best of both worlds and um oh totally yeah and and really just like in your house the the kitchen in the fire hall is is really the heart of of the fire station because that is where people congregate that's where people chat that's where people share and and then share food and so it it really is a a bonding and and teamwork and uh, it's just a, a really positive environment. Well, thank you so much.
thank you, ladies. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, thank you for humoring me and uh, and for uh, allowing me to to share what I know and what I don't know. Yeah, have a great snow day. Thank you. Yeah. You too. Yes. You too. Thank you. Awesome. You guys rock. Thank you really Aww. do. Thank you. And uh, live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is Heather. I'm here with my husband, Todd. Hi, Todd. Hello. <laughs> what did you think of that? Carol has a lot of good safety information for us. She's a safety bear, that's for sure. Yep, she's she knows her stuff. But you also have gathered some information for our episode. You took your phone and went to work with a list of questions that I gave you. Mm-hmm. Do you have any big takeaways? Was there anything that stood out from what they said? Yeah, I think the, the one of the main things is the fire department's not just about uh, safety and it's not just about cooking to eat. There's also team bonding, camaraderie, friendships, and having a laugh once in a while. Yeah. that I mean, if you, if you don't have that while you're sharing meals, it'd be pretty boring, right? Well, it's the same thing you have around with your family at home. It's not just about you know, filling your stomach. It's about spending time together and getting to know each other better. That's right. Okay, so we're going to play a few of those clips of you asking questions and big thank you to Colin and Ben who provided a few answers. Thanks, Todd. You're welcome. (laughs) Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Good. Colin, would you say that there's a lot of good cooks at the fire station? There's a lot of bad cooks at the fire station, but (laughs) yes, there are some very good cooks. We actually have some Red Seal chefs on the fire department as well, too. They uh, did their culinary training before getting on the fire department, and we've got people of all different walks of life, so we have some fantastic cooks on the job. Is everybody a good cook at the fire station? I would say absolutely not. There is some that are good and some that are really bad. Uh, who decides what you're going to have? And has it, the meals changed since you started on the fire department? Typically, the old grouchy captains tell us what they want to eat. And then the firefighters say, no, that's unhealthy. You old dinosaur, you. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have that. What do we make and who decides? Well, I would say a wide variety of different meals get made. Some halls tend to be more simple. Some halls like to go very elaborate. So I would say pretty much anything you can think of, it's probably been made in a fire hall. Who decides would probably be, most crews I would say, uh, everyone kind of takes a vote. Usually driver position down, but officers and allsmen would definitely have a say. But like I said, they don't really do the cooking, so if they need to veto it, we'll veto it. Which crew members do the majority of the cooking? Would probably be the driver rank and below. What would happen, you're a senior man, what would happen if you have a very new... Well. You're old enough. If you had a brand new rookie, how do you help with the meals? You are the vegetable chopper. You get to start the barbecue, maybe look at the meat and maybe put it on. Somebody else will cook it for you. But typically your job would be cutting the vegetables and getting the things ready for the meal and maybe supervising and just kind of watching from a distance until you kind of get your feet wet. How do you decide how much to buy? Crews can vary between four to, you know, 12. So is it difficult to decide how much food to actually get? Yes, there's a couple rules of thumb. Uh, 100 grams of, you know, meat, uh, chicken breast, a a firefighter, so to speak. And there's some very large mammals on the department who like to eat a lot. So you can never have too much is always the saying but if you have under that's not good and you'll hear about that for a very long time so it's always good to have a little bit extra and crews typically like to cook a little extra too knowing that the junior members aren't making as much money they get to take the leftovers home which is kind of nice at the end of the shift to bring home to their families and say hey uh, these are the fun recipes we're making and and kind of go from there is there any uh, traditions around meals or special meals that we may have on the fire department? Uh, promotion dinners and holidays would probably be the, the big one. So every time you're promoted from one rank to another rank, I guess it w- would be an uh, unwritten rule or a tradition that you would uh, pay for a meal for your crew for like the, the promotion. It's a nice big slab of meat or something like that. And uh, maybe you invite your family in and anybody else that's kind of helped you out to get promoted to that next stage. And then the holidays days is always a big one too our big meal would be christmas time unfortunately with covid we haven't been able to have families in the station or anybody 
What is the, can you think of the best meal you've ever had or a meal that you enjoy the most? I always like the promotion dinners because it's always like a good slab of meat, the prime rib, and that's got all the trimmings. You've got mashed potatoes, it, uh, any types of vegetables. You could imagine Yorkshire pudding and gravy and there's desserts and lots of people there and it's laughing and telling stories of the old days. It's those are always my favorite meals. I think the the promotion dinners or the the retirement meals, I guess, would be very similar to that. But it's somebody's last big meal when their family comes in, and it's whatever they they wanted for their big last meal. And lots of the old guard come and say bye to that firefighter. It's actually pretty fun. Those are good meals to have. What about the worst? There's some terrible cooks on the job, but they got to learn somehow. So you got to choke down some pretty horrible meals. We can only do so much, but these meals can be pretty horrible. I've had an unwashed salad before where there was grains of sand and dirt still on the salad. and That was awful. Or just a, a plain ketchup soup, it seemed like, with like a cheese bread. Like it was it was terrible. It was cardboard. Uh, that was probably one of the worst meals I've ever had before is one of those. The best meal I ever had, I was fortunate um, in my rookie year, actually. A captain was retiring, so they flew out for him a bunch of lobster from the Atlantic, and I've never, I'd have never had lobster before that point. So we had steak and lobster, and it was very well cooked, and yeah, that was easily the best meal I've ever had. What about the worst? The worst meal I've ever had also probably happened in my rookie year. Um, and we had these big, big steaks and the gentleman cooking them, cooked them extremely blue to the point where I would just call it a raw steak. And I was gagging the entire time eating it. I was, my tear, my eyes were watering, but because I was new and I was a rookie, I didn't know what to do or what to say. So I just ate the whole thing, but it made me feel very sick after. And uh, yeah, that was probably the worst meal I've ever had. What happens if the tones go off while you're making supper? We usually try to evaluate if it's a serious call. And it, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, if the tones go off, uh, it's basically just a full stop. Um, we just leave. And depending on the meal, we might pull something out of the oven so it doesn't overcook. But we're very used to eating either overcooked food or dried out food because we have to leave it often. So basically at the fire hall, it's our home while we're here. We're in charge and making sure that we do all the cleaning and cooking of the high, full station and buying groceries. Is there been any funny stories around that? Oh, son of a... That's Perfect a good timing. One. That's a good question. This episode of Three Kitchens is brought to you by ATB. At ATB, we make banking work for you. With expert and practical advice in everyday banking and investment planning expertise and management services with ATB Wealth, you can be confident that you're making smart choices when it comes to your money. We have a history of doing what's right for our clients, especially when times are tough, because ATB was built to help Albertans. For more information, visit atb.com. Okay, so here we're back. Um, this has been jam-packed so far with lots of fun stuff, but we do have a recipe. It's not jam-packed. Oh. It's cheesecake pack. packed. Packed. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, so one of the firehouse traditions that I have learned is if a member, if a firefighter is taking a significant amount of holidays, the tradition is that they bring in dessert for the crew on their last shift before they're off work. One more way of getting some good food. I'm just teasing. It sounds like one more thing for the spouse to do. In Sometimes, case. in your in case. case. <laughs> yeah, because we know you're the one that's doing it. So it's like, yeah. here, honey, cook a dessert for 12. <laughs> yes, and you've heard me complain about this probably many times. Not complain, but I'm like, you're oh, not I, say, I also have to do dessert for... <laughs> right. Anyway, it's totally fine. But I thought that that was fitting as a way of thanking them and incorporating an episode, I mean, a recipe into our episode. Yes. Sarah helped me out. We made a dessert for the crew and mm -hmm. for Carol um, and to share with her family. So what we made is a Nanaimo bar. This is a no-bake Nanaimo bar cheesecake. The recipe is from therecipe-rebel.com, mm. but we adapted it to, instead of making a cake, mm -hmm. we put these into individual jam jars. So let me just run through what goes into this. So the bottom crust 
layer, which we did more like a crumble and less like a crust, mm -hmm. is butter, sugar, cocoa, egg, graham crumbs, finely chopped almonds, and sweetened shredded coconut. So you're kind of cooking it on the stove, like melt the butter, then stir in the sugar, cocoa, an egg right, um, right. on your dry stuff, mix it all together and you have your crust. So normally if you're making a cake, you would press that in your pan. We just use a cookie scoop and put it into our jars. The filling is made of cream cheese, bird's custard powder, whipping cream, and powdered sugar. The bird's custard powder is the thing that makes it yellow and what makes it Nanaimo, because that's what goes in a Nanaimo bar. Mm, okay. And then your very top layer is uh, dark chocolate ganache, which is dark chocolate and heavy cream. There you go. So this is interesting because you made something that you cannot eat. <laughs> it's, it's very true. I cannot eat the cheesecake part because it's too much dairy for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if I can say, I always think the best part of the Nanaimo bar is that bottom crust. Really? Yeah, I love that bottom crust. Even as a oh. kid, I would eat the top part off and then save just the crust for the end because oh, I love that bottom part. Mm. <laughs> I like it all together. Yeah, I like, mm. I like that creamy filling and that uh, yum. Give some tips on how to put this in. This is the first time I'd put a dessert into a jar. Have you guys I've done this before? I've done it with the shorter ones, but not the taller one. Yeah. Hmm. So you used an eight ounce mason jar. You collected a whole bunch of those. And so they were a little taller. And when Heather says we made this, we didn't make, she made all of it. I just showed up, asked for a cocktail, and then, <laughs> and then got directions on how to put things together. And really <laughs> took all of 10 minutes to do it, but we were there for, I was over for like way longer than that. It was, it was fun. Like 20 minutes. <laughs> no, we, we, did some, we did some other. We sat and had our vodka, and then we oh, I love and it. And then we shot a video for another podcast, mm -hmm. and then we, you know, we did some stuff. We worked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Quotation marks. Um. So, so I guess the crust goes in first, and you do want to use a cookie scoop, or you want to use two spoons to kind of because it actually sticks onto your spoon so you want to use the other spoon to kind of scrape it off mm -hmm. and you can press it in a little if you want and then Heather put the cheesecake filling in a Ziploc bag and she piped it in right mm -hmm. Heather and yeah. I think this was the best thing to do because when we didn't do that it was it got quite messy it's hard to scoop mm -hmm. into there yeah and at this point you want to put it in your fridge and let it set for a bit oh right because it's no bait we realized that when we didn't set it, we had, um, when we put the ganache on top, it sort of seeped through ah. to the, on the sides. And if you want it layered, mm -hmm. what does it say? It Heather? says pour it over the crust, refrigerate to chill. Okay. I think we had it in there for maybe 15 minutes or so. Did you say? Yeah. And then took it out and then uh, put the ganache in. I think you put the ganache in with a spoon. I just kind of spooned some Drizzled on the it. top. Mm -hmm. I don't want the ganache too warm. If the ganache is still warm, it is going to kind of melt again, like melt that right. cake layer. And it's very runny, right? So like, yeah, we noticed that the ganache thickened as it cooled down. So mm -hmm. yeah, it made it easier to pour as a layer, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's a quick way of packing it. Do you think it was an easy recipe? Heather? Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, you're really yeah. just whipping it all up with your mixer super fast. That's a nice way to have like a to go treat. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's nice and easy to transport and it looks kind of nice and it's individually portioned mm -hmm. like if I had sent that to the fire station they would have had to slice it right like whole cake I mean mm -hmm. whereas jars they each had their jar yeah so who can talk about what it tastes like since it's not me it tasted like a Nanaimo bar it was very creamy and delicious the ganache was very very chocolatey the bottom was oh I love the coconut in that and I shared half with my husband and I played the can you guess what this is game mm -hmm. he did not guess <laughs> he just ate he just ate oh <laughs> it was like mm, give me another bite <laughs> mm, give me another bite <laughs> mm. and I was like oh mm. I see what he's doing it was a big portion it was super duper sweet yeah so the crust was salty and coconutty I love that part Mm -hmm. And then you had the filling that was really fatty and creamy, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had that rich sort of that chocolate, which I love chocolate, chocolate ganache on top. I thought it was made for a beautiful bite. Frankly, just for me, you know, I'm not a big desserty person. 
I would have gotten, I would have liked it in a smaller container for mm -hmm. individual size, but my husband and my kids were not impressed with the quantity I brought back <laughs> because they wanted a lot more than <laughs> what I gave them. They loved yeah. it. Every, it was a really, it's a really good to go. I like that you could go on a picnic and sort of pack these up. Mm -hmm. Really great idea. Yeah. Very tasty. Yeah. I, I will agree with the smaller jar size. It would be easier to get your spoon into the bottom too, mm, to crack that right. crust at the bottom. But as they say, the fire department has some rather large mammals. So a bigger <laughs> And serving. hopefully larger spoons. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe larger spoons. <laughs> so they, they probably appreciated having a bigger serving. Well, I did have them in mind when I chose which jar size. I yeah. thought maybe they would appreciate the bigger serving. I got a report um, and a photo mm -hmm. sent to me that they enjoyed oh, it. Nice. I think overall it was a success. Um, now, you know, I didn't eat it just because it's dairy, but I was happy to make it and I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. It was very good. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Thanks so much for, uh, for making that. Thank you so much to everybody at the fire hall and the Calgary fire department for helping us out with this episode and giving us a sneak peek behind the scenes. Good stories. And, and for a really fun episode there was a, a lot of laughs and now for the fine print we at three kitchens gratefully acknowledge we are telling these stories in the traditional territories of the treaty seven nations in southern alberta and the metis nation of alberta region three we honor the rich tradition of oral storytellers on this land who have come before us you can find pictures and recipe links on Instagram and Facebook at Three Kitchens Podcast. If you like and subscribe on your podcast player, that helps more people find us. I know my dad's a firefighter, but I'm not sure about cooking.